Ever wonder what it takes to build a flight simulator so real it could fool a Top Gun pilot? <laughs> or in this case, help train one. Okay, he got me there. And speaking of Top Gun, that's exactly where our deep dive takes us today. We're buckling up to explore the career of Frank Riedel, a flight simulator innovator and developer who actually worked on the Dark Star project for Top Gun Maverick. Talk about a resume booster. Right, but we're going beyond the Hollywood glitz and digging into the why behind Frank's incredible journey. Precisely. We have a treasure trove of sources for this deep dive. Excerpts from Frank's resume, a fascinating article from PC Pilot Magazine about his company's F-16 simulator, and even a newsletter article from the prestigious National Test Pilot School highlighting his work there. It's like piecing together a puzzle, except instead of a boring landscape, we get a high-flying career in aviation technology. And what a career it is. So where do we even begin with someone who has their hands in so many aeronautical pies? Let's start with the foundation, Frank's lifelong passion for flight simulation. His resume reads like a love letter to it, starting in childhood and continuing through the founding of his company, Yu, Yu Fal Y, back in 2000. 2000. That's practically the stone age of tech startups. I can only imagine what it took to get a flight simulator company off the ground back then. No pun intended. No, I see what you did there. But you're right, it was a different landscape. And that's what makes Frank's story even more impressive. He clearly wasn't afraid to defy gravity, both in the simulators he built and in his entrepreneurial spirit. And speaking of building, one thing that struck me about his resume is the sheer breadth of his technical skills. We're talking coding, 3D printing, CNC machining. This isn't just someone who dabbles. It's like he took a running leap into the world of hands-on tech. Absolutely. And that hands-on approach is key to understanding his success. Take his F-16 simulator, for example. The PC Pilot article raves about its realism, but it's not just about visual fidelity. Frank actually used a force feedback control loading system that mimicked the feeling of flying a real F-16. Whoa, hold on, rewind. Force feedback in a flight simulator, what does that even feel like? Talk about immersive. Imagine the resistance you feel when you turn the steering wheel of a car. Now apply that to a flight stick, replicating the pressure and feedback a pilot would experience maneuvering an F-16. That's what made Frank's simulator so groundbreaking. It wasn't just about looking at a screen, it was about feeling the flight. That's incredible. It's like he bridged the gap between simulation and reality, right. giving pilots an experience that was as close to the real thing as you could get without actually leaving the ground. Exactly. And when you think about the technology available back in 2000, it's even more impressive. He was pushing the boundaries of what was possible, and that drive to innovate is evident throughout his career. Speaking of which, his resume also highlighted a significant military background. It made me realize that his journey isn't just about technical brilliance, but also leadership and strategy. Absolutely. Frank served in both the Air Force and the Special Forces. Talk about high pressure environments that demand not only technical proficiency, but also the ability to make critical decisions under pressure and lead teams effectively. All right. These experiences undoubtedly shaped his leadership style and his approach to problem solving. It makes you wonder if those military experiences planted the seeds for Yu Flay Y's eventual shift towards military training simulations. Did he see a need for more realistic, immersive training tools based on his own time in the service? That's a very astute observation. While we don't have any direct quotes from Frank about his motivations, it's certainly a compelling connection. And we do see that shift happening in 2016, a time when virtual reality technology was really taking off. Oh, yeah. VR was exploding onto the scene. Everyone was suddenly talking about headsets and motion tracking and stepping into these incredibly realistic virtual worlds. Was Frank incorporating those emerging VR technologies into his simulators at that point? That's where things get really fascinating. While the sources don't explicitly confirm if VR was integrated into UFLY's simulators at that specific time, we do get a glimpse of Frank's forward thinking in his resume. He highlights his work developing a Microsoft Holland's experience for a Gen 6 helmet replica. Now hold on, Holland M's for flight simulation. That sounds incredibly advanced, even for today. What exactly does that even entail? Imagine a pilot wearing a helmet, not only with a heads-up display, but also with augmented reality overlays powered by the HoloLens. They could potentially see virtual targets, experience simulated system failures, or even receive guidance and instructions from remote instructors, all while feeling like they're inside the cockpit. Wow, that's next level. It sounds like something straight out of a science fiction movie. It's clear that Frank was not content with simply keeping up with technology. He was actively seeking ways to push those boundaries and redefine what was possible in flight simulation. 
Absolutely. And speaking of pushing boundaries, his next career move took him to the pinnacle of aviation training, the National Test Pilot School, or NTPS for short. NTPS, isn't that the place where they train, well, test pilots, the people who push the limits of aircraft design and performance? What an incredible opportunity for Frank to contribute his expertise to that world. Exactly. NTPS is renowned for its rigorous training programs and its commitment to innovation. And they chose Frank to lead their simulator program, a testament to his expertise and his ability to create training tools for the most demanding aviation professionals. I can only imagine the level of precision and realism expected in those simulators. We're not talking about casual weekend flyers here. These are test pilots who need to experience every nuance of flight, every subtle change in aircraft performance in a safe and controlled environment. You're absolutely right. And it's in this high stakes environment that Frank's ingenuity truly shines. The newsletter article specifically highlights his work on a remarkable project, the conversion of a BO-105 helicopter cockpit into a fully functional EC-145 simulator. Wait, rewind. Converting one helicopter cockpit into a completely different type of helicopter simulator. Mm -hmm. That sounds more like an engineering magic trick than a typical project. It's like transforming a bicycle into a motorcycle. Yeah. You're starting with something vaguely familiar, but the end result is a whole different beast. Mm -hmm. I'm dying to know, how do you even begin in to tackle a project like that. It's a testament to Frank's resourcefulness and deep understanding of both aviation and simulation technology. Instead of building an entirely new simulator from scratch, which would have been incredibly expensive and time consuming, right. he found a way to breathe new life into existing equipment. That's some serious MacGyver level ingenuity right there. Yeah. But we're not just talking about swapping out a few gauges and calling it a day, right? Mm. What kind of technical wizardry was involved in actually making that BO-105 cockpit behave like an EC-145. You hit the nail on the head. This was a complete overhaul of the cockpit systems. We're talking about integrating modern avionics, the electronic systems that control the aircraft, customizing the control systems to match the EC-145's unique flight characteristics, and ensuring that the simulator software accurately replicated the feel of flying the actual helicopter. And all of this had to be done while working within the constraints of an existing cockpit structure. It's like performing open heart surgery while remodeling a house at the same time. Wow. That's an incredible challenge. And speaking of challenges, I was struck by something mentioned in the newsletter article. Apparently, Frank didn't just hold himself up in a lab with a soldering iron and a mountain of circuit boards. He made this a true team effort, collaborating closely with the NTPS flight instructors and maintenance technicians. Exactly. And that speaks volumes about his leadership style. He understood that creating a truly effective simulator required input from the people who knew these aircraft inside and out the instructors who trained on them, and the technicians who kept them flying. It's like he created a fusion of engineering expertise, piloting experience, and technical know-how, a recipe for an incredibly realistic and effective training tool. The newsletter even included a quote from one of the NTPS instructors praising the simulator's fidelity and saying it was the next best thing to actually flying the EC-145. That's high praise coming from a test pilot. Absolutely. And it wasn't just the technical achievement that earned him recognition. Remember how his resume mentioned that he won a SPOT award at NTPS for exhibiting both exceptional teamwork and mentorship? Oh, yeah. The SPOT award. Don't leave me hanging. Tell me more about that. What exactly did he do to deserve such an honor? Well, the recommendation letter mentioned a specific instance where Frank went above and beyond to help a group of graduate assistants who were struggling with a particularly challenging project involving, get this, the development of a real-time data acquisition system for one of the simulators. Oh, real-time data acquisition. That sounds incredibly complex. What exactly does that even mean in the context of flight simulation? Essentially, it means capturing and analyzing vast amounts of data from the simulator while it's running. Think about things like engine parameters, flight control inputs, even the pilot's physiological responses. This data is crucial for evaluating the simulator's performance, identifying areas for improvement, and even personalizing the training experience for each pilot. Wow, so we're talking about crunching numbers on a whole other level. What did Frank do to help those graduate students? Did he just swoop in and solve the problem for them? Not at all. And that's what's so impressive about his mentorship style. Instead of simply providing the answers, he took the time to guide the students through the problem-solving process. He shared his expertise, offered encouragement, and empowered them to find their own solutions. That's the mark of a true leader. Someone who not only possesses deep knowledge, but also understands the importance of sharing that knowledge and empowering others to grow. Precisely. 
And that brings us back to the bigger picture of Frank's career. He could have easily chosen to focus solely on the technical aspects of flight simulation, becoming a brilliant but isolated innovator. But instead, he embraced collaboration, mentorship, and the power of sharing his knowledge, which ultimately amplified his impact on the field. So as we prepare for landing after this incredible deep dive into the world of Frank Riedel, what's the key takeaway for our listeners? What can we glean from his journey? Whether we're aspiring engineers, budding entrepreneurs, or simply admirers of a life well lived. What you see here is my power thermal panel for the F 35 simulator to demonstrate the building technique. It's a PCB panel, backplate panel that I designed, and the, everything is connected directly into sockets and uh, very few wires. Only a USB cable and a power supply cable goes into each panel. Very simple, very rigid, very cheap, very solid way of building panels for a simulator. So here we are on the front side of the panel. You can see the backlight and the switches. On the screen you see a MATLAB Simulink project title Arduino panel test that I made to demonstrate interfacing and interacting with the simulator panels. Now we use the sine wave as a simulation source going from 0 to 1 just to have a source and when the uh, source switches to aim or 0 we flip the switch and we turn on the LED on pin 14 on the panel, which is a green LED on the panel. And the Arduino input, we use a switch on the panel to, again, flip a switch here and send a signal to the scope. On the scope, we can see two lines. The orange, no, the yellow one is the sine wave, 0 and 1, and the blue line is the input panel, the input Arduino input. So let's run it. And here we see when the sine wave goes to one, the green light turns on on the board. And when it goes to zero, it turns it off. Again, turns on and turns off. And the blue line is connected to this switch here. So if I flip the switch, we have the blue line going to one in the scope and if I flip it to the other side again it goes to zero. Very good demonstration of how to interface MATLAB Simulink to Arduino panels.